Yeah, I'm happy to do it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sparkle. I'm Lisa Martin with Silver Spring Town Center, and we present Sparkle with Silver Spring Village. We are so pleased to be celebrating Earth Day with a special program. Earth Day Change Starts with You with Lisa Alexander from the Audubon Naturalist Society. So we're in for a real treat. Um, SSTCI, um, Silver Spring Town Center, also has some other events this month in celebration of Earth Day. On Earth Day itself, we have a double header. That's Thursday, April 22nd. We have at six o'clock, um, we have Fungal Futures, Art and Science Find Common Ground with artist Jackie Hoisted and biologist Grace Hoisted, PhD, who is her niece. Um, and then at 8 p.m., we have our featured artist of the month, uh, In Search of Meaning, a visual conversation in the studio with, studio with Lily Fisher. So she incorporates physics and science um, in, her, in her work, and we'll be discussing that. Uh, and then also really related to science and our lives, is a special program. We're inviting back Smithsonian curator Jim Deutsch to present expressions of pandemic folklore, <coughs> case studies from 1918 and 2020, looking at how, how people perceived um, the pandemic, then the mythologies and the conspiracy theories that existed even back then. Um, in May, I hope you will tune in for some of our programs that, that pay tribute to uh, Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And um, our featured artist in May is Thursday, June 6th, Reclaim Your Power to Recreate and Heal in the studio with contemporary folk artist Neha Mizra. Then we have many other interesting programs throughout the month of May. Um, we also have our Wednesday night movies next Wednesday, and we'll be watching the documentary film about Michelle Obama, Becoming, and that's hosted by um, Montgomery College professor um, Dave Rothman. So all of our events are made possible with generous support from Montgomery County, United Therapeutics, the Arts and Humanities of Montgomery County, Maryland State Arts, and many others. And also, before we get to the program next Join us for next month's Sparkle when we welcome writer Kenneth Wise presenting The Road Less Traveled, a writer's workshop. So come and share your writing with us. And now I will turn it over to Doug, who will kick us off with the program. Thank you. And I'm Doug Gaddis, Executive Director at Silver Spring Village. Uh, our purpose in in the village is to make aging and community an exciting and rewarding experience. Um, we do that by providing nearly 3,000 uh, community-based volunteer services each year to assist older adults in uh, continuing to live in their homes and communities of choice. And we also present over 600 uh, social, educational, cultural, recreational events each year. Obviously, for the last year, they have mostly been in these little boxes arrayed across your computer screen. But in normal times, we're to be seen out and about all through Silver Spring and the greater metro area. So if you are knowing more about us, either as a volunteer or as a member, uh, please check out our website at silverspringvillage.org. And now I would like to introduce Lisa Alexander, who is the executive director at the Audubon Naturalist Society, which is one of those uh, recognized suburban gems that we get to in Montgomery County. And uh, Lisa is also a friend of mine from church, so it was pretty easy to twist her arm to come join us today. And I will turn it over to her um, and let her tell you. Uh, a bit about her background and, of course, the Naturalist Society. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa and <laughs> Doug. Yeah, Doug, in fact, and I had cooked up a plan for me to do this talk last year on April Fools. 
And it really was April Fool's Day because the pandemic quashed those plans, but our friendship continued and uh, we just remade the plan for this year. So what I'm going to do is uh, share some slides with you and I'll do the presentation kind of in two parts. First, I'll tell you a little bit more about Audubon Naturalist Society, and then I will talk specifically about actions you can take this Earth Month and on Earth Day and every day to help our planet. So I'm going to do the share screen magic. Audubon Naturalist Society is uh, headquartered in Chevy Chase, Maryland at beautiful Wood End Sanctuary. I hope that you've had a chance to visit it. Our mission is really to help people enjoy, learn about, and protect nature here in the DC metro region. So a brief history of Audubon will include my lifelong connection almost to the organization. I'll tell you about ANS's future vision, and then we'll conclude with how you can help. And I've titled this section, Seven Actions for Seven Generations. So Audubon societies were formed all around the nation in the late 1800s. They were formed primarily by women who were um, horrified by the uptick in use of birds, feathers, in fact, entire bodies of birds for fashion. So you'd see women with entire birds on their hats or birds draped around their necks as stoles. And these Audubon societies were quite remarkable because not only were they founded and run primarily by women, but these women actually advocated successfully for the passage of federal legislation to protect birds even before they had the right to vote. So that's some pretty powerful lobbying. And in fact, Audubon societies were credited with having the Migratory Bird Treaty Act passed in 1918. And that's still foundational bird protection legislation in our nation today. So more power to the women of the Audubon societies. Audubon Naturalist Society was actually founded in Washington DC as the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia. One of our heroes is Florence Merriman Bailey. She helped to found Audubon Society of the District of Columbia, and she was an early writer of field guides. You know, we sort of think of Roger Tory Peterson, also an Audubon National Society member and board member, as the father of field guides, but way back at the turn of the century, Florence was writing field guides herself, including one named Birds Through the Opera Glass. What I think about when I look at this picture of Florence is, can you imagine going birding in that outfit? I'm glad we can go out and look for birds in much better outfits today. Another one of our heroes was President Theodore Roosevelt. He was a card carrying member of the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia. And in fact, we used to host some of our meetings at the White House. He was the father of the national parks, but also an avid birder. And urban legend has it that one of the ways that Theodore Roosevelt would test the um, loyalty of his staff members is he would take them skinny dipping in Rock Creek Park. So that must have been something to see. I don't think any Audubon Society members skinny dipped with him. Another one of our heroes is Rachel Carson. She sat on our board of directors. She was one of our members. And of course, the author of many wonderful nat, uh, books about natural history, but most famously, Silent Spring. Silent Spring was the clarion call that pesticides were harming our environment. And Rachel Carson's work, despite being vilified by business and media and even Congress, really did change the course of American history. Because of Silent Spring, DDT was banned. And as a result, our eagles that were on the brink of extinction because of DDT use softening their shells in their eggs, uh, they have resurged to an all-time high in eagle populations in the United States. In addition, Rachel Carson's work was credited with um, being the impetus for starting the Environmental Protection Agency. And while it might not seem like it today, environmental protection has a long history of being bipartisan. And one of the ways you might know that is because it was Richard Nixon who signed the Environmental Protection Agency into being. 
So we thank Rachel. One of the hallmarks of Audubon Naturalist Society's work over time has been the protection of rare natural places in our region. And here's a short list of all of the places that we've protected. A long time ago, the CNO Canal was slated to become a roadway. And we marched with the uh, Washington Post reporters, uh, Justice William O. Douglas, the length of the CNO Canal and convinced the region to protect it as the national preserve that we all appreciate so much today. We helped conserve Huntley Meadows Park in Virginia and save Dyke Marsh from development in Virginia. We helped to found Mason Neck Park and preserve Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. You might remember in the 1980s, Disney was planning to set up a theme park right on top of Manassas National Battlefield. And we began the coalition that got Disney out of Manassas. Most recently, we were able to preserve 10 Mile Creek, which is a tributary that feeds the emergency drinking water supply for 4 million people. And by limiting development in the 10 Mile Creek watershed, we protected our emergency drinking water supply. We have two nature sanctuaries. Right nearby Silver Spring in Chevy Chase, Maryland is Woodend Nature Sanctuary. And here's where my lifelong connection to Audubon Naturalist Society began. When I was fresh out of college and so yearning for a job in a science museum or a nature center or a national park, the only organization that said yes was Audubon Natural Society. So my very first job out of college was as an education intern with ANS. And back in the day, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I actually lived in the third floor of the Audubon Mansion. So there I was, a ripe old age of 22, all alone on 40 acres inside the Beltway. It was quite a way to start my career. We keep Woodend open to the public 365 days a year, and right now it's putting on a dazzling show of wildflowers in bloom. So if you want to see all your wildflowers in one place, please come to visit. We also have a nature sanctuary in Leesburg, Virginia, Rust Nature Sanctuary. It's 68 acres, also free and open to the public 365 days a year. And unlike Woodend, you can bring your dog to Rust Nature Sanctuary. So it's a great place for a long dog walk. One of the special things about this sanctuary is that it has a vernal pool. Vernal means a pool that is full of water in spring, but not the rest of the year. But this vernal pool is the home to the Jefferson salamander, that slimy guy you see in the right-hand corner of the screen. And the Jefferson salamander is one of our endangered salamanders. Salamanders are not particularly well adapted to climate change. They're very sensitive to temperature changes. And so being able to preserve the habitat of an endangered salamander feels like a great conservation victory. Our work today has continued to evolve, just like our name changed from Audubon Society of the District of Columbia to Audubon Naturalist Society. And now we have three mission pillars, conservation, education, and restoration. Our environmental education for children is one of our hallmarks. We are uh, involved with all of our region's public schools, so we provide environmental education free of charge to schools in Prince George's County, Montgomery County, the District of Columbia, Fairfax, Arlington, and Loudoun County Public Schools. Of course, it's been all on Zoom for this past year, but in a non-pandemic year, we get kids' hands on gardening outside, planting native plant gardens, growing their own organic salad greens, learning to recycle, to conserve energy. And then we want to make sure that after school time is not just more screen time for kids. So we host after school programs at school grounds and at our sanctuaries. And we're famous for our summer camp because kids should get muddy in the summer and we make sure that they do. So we host a robust summer camp at our Wood End Nature Sanctuary to make sure that kids have those essential experiences of falling in love with nature. 
I like to say that when I was a kid, my mom would throw me out the door and lock it behind me and say, don't come home until dinner time. But that doesn't happen so much today for our kids. Our kids are very scheduled, very screen focused. And so the role that we play is to make sure that they form that fundamental connection to nature that will ensure that they become nature stewards of the future. But we also do what I like to call cradle to cane education. We have a robust program of adult education. And I hope that you will tune in to some of our programs at anshome.org. We've launched a lot of virtual classes this year on nature education, one called the Naturalist Hour. You can have your happy hour with us and learn something new about nature. But in addition, we have field trips and forays throughout the region. And we are in fact hosting in-person field trips, albeit with masks and uh, small groups. And we host a robust community science program. Now you might remember community science being called citizen science, but recently it's come to our attention that you really don't have to be a citizen to participate. Anyone in our community can get out into nature collect data about what's happening in the natural world and help scientists track and uh, predict what will happen as a result of climate change. We've even developed our own smartphone app called Creek Critters. And it's a self-guided experience where you use your phone, you collect little aquatic insects in the stream and those aquatic insects have different levels of pollution tolerance. So they're sort of like the canaries in the coal mine. It means that um, if you find one kind of in insect, it means that the stream is quite clean. And if you find another kind of insect, it means the stream is not so clean after all. So you can actually score your stream health using our smartphone app. That big creature on the person's hand in the middle of the screen is one of our more exciting aquatic insects and it's called a helgramite. And in fact, there was even a comic book character that was named and drawn to look just like that Helgramite. Our con conservation advocacy really focuses today around climate resilience. And there are three pillars of that climate resilience advocacy. One is sound land use planning, what we build, where we build it and how we build it are really critical to helping our region become more resilient to and mitigate the effects of climate change. At the same time, we want to preserve the rare green spaces we have here in our region. And as you probably all experienced, one of the most tangible results of climate change is the increasing intensity of the storms in our region. Those rain events are happening in these big bursts that send water whooshing through our systems, scouring out the stream banks, driving pollution into our streams and into the river and the Chesapeake Bay. And so figuring out how to manage the water that comes off of our rooftops and our driveways and our parking lots is really an important part of armoring the region to be ready to withstand the impacts of climate change. And then of course, restoring habitats across the region. If you come to Wood End Sanctuary, not only will you see beautiful wildflowers in bloom, but you will also see construction equipment. And you might wonder how do those two things go together? Well, we're in the process of restoring our stream on the sanctuary, clean drinking stream. And I'm hoping that about three or four years from now, that picture of a stream on the right of your screen is what it will look like. Uh, we're adding hundreds of native plants and trees. We're restoring meadows and we're making sure that throughout our region, we have wildlife corridors. I was talking to a breeding bird researcher at Connecticut College. Connecticut College is one of the, uh, has one of the oldest longest standing breeding bird research programs in the nation. And the researcher felt certain that birds could adapt to climate change but may not be able to adapt to the fragmentation of habitats. So you can imagine if you're a migrating bird making your way up from South America up into the Northern United States, 
you need a lot of resting places along the way. And as our habitats get fragmented and get further apart, it's harder for those bird species to make the journey because they don't have places to drop down to rest and refuel. So making sure that our urban spaces have restored habitats as these little beads in a green necklace that will help our migrating wildlife, that's really important to us at Audubon Natural Society. And we wanna demonstrate it not just at our sanctuaries, but help people implement it throughout their communities. So here's our new vision for the future, nature for all. This idea that nature should be for all people and all wildlife. And haven't we needed nature more than ever now? With the pandemic, so many more people have gotten outside because that was all we had to do. And being outside lets you feel for yourself the restorative power of nature, how it can calm your stresses and how it can sort of heal the tensions in your body. So we really want to focus on nature for all for the future. We are doing a couple of really exciting things on that front. First, we've created two signature conferences. One is called Naturally Latinos and the other is called Taking Nature Black. And these two conferences have been running since 2016 on alternate years. And they are designed specifically to lift up the voices of environmental professionals of color. We had a little silver lining from the pandemic this year because we had to go virtual with our conferences and Taking Nature Black that was held in uh, February of this year had a record breaking 940 people attend. So we feel really proud of finding places to lift up the voices of environmental professionals of color. But Nature for All also means demonstrating those best green practices wherever we can. So when you come to Wood and Nature Sanctuary, you will see all kinds of greening, whether it's native plant gardens or rain gardens like the one in this picture. You'll see permeable parking lots where the water soaks in instead of runs off. You'll see permeable pathways, again, where water soaks in. And you'll see all the different ways that people either in their own land or on community land can support nature and mitigate climate change. One of the key features of all is really thinking about all the people in our region, people who speak other languages. So our interpretation is now in both Spanish and English and relies either on universal symbols or on uh, visuals, on photographs and images to help tell the story. We are also in the process of con constructing a wheelchair accessible nature trail so that anyone who has a mobility assistance device can visit all of our habitats, our forest, our stream, our meadows, our pond. And we hope that that nature trail will be finished by this June. So that's an exciting thing to come visit. As part of our Nature for All restoration of Wood End Sanctuary, we're adding to that palette of things we do to encourage the next generation to become environmental stewards. And that's by creating a nature play space. And nature play space is a very Define space so that parents and teachers and caregivers feel safe bringing their kids there. But it's designed just to inspire kids to do what we all did growing up. Play in the mud, climb on trees, jump on logs, scramble over boulders. And what's going to be exceptionally special about our nature trail is that it will be accessible to kids who use wheelchairs, walkers, and canes. So all kids of all abilities can have that very special experience of playing in nature. And so before we get to the next thing, I think what I'll do is stop sharing and just ask if anybody has any questions about Audubon Natural Society. And I do you guys usually do that in the chat? How do you usually do that, Doug? Um, usually uh, people just will raise their hand. Uh, everyone is pretty much muted at this point. So if you have questions, just signal. I see uh, Martine and then Roy. I just wanted to, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that your summary was very impressive. Well, what a lot you. of great stuff you have going on. 
We do, we're excited. It's been a little challenging in the pandemic because we're outside people who like to be outside with other people. So we've had to get really yeah. creative this past year. And Roy, I believe you were not. Uh, Doug, I was wondering how many of the attendees today know that the one and only Rachel Carson was a resident of beautiful Woodside Park here in Silver Spring. Mm. Yes, yeah, she's in the Rachel Carson Council helps to manage her property and you can visit it. Uh, what, what street is she on? Was she on? You know, Roy, I have to say my pandemic brain is full. That information's in there somewhere, but I don't know that I can pull it out at this moment. I, I live on Woodside Parkway myself. And I was told she lived very near here. She did, and her house is um, marked. And so if you just look up Rachel Carson Council, you'll be oh. able to find how to connect with her. Well, good. That's great to know, Roy. Yeah. I knew she was Silver Spring, but I didn't know she was this close. Yeah, she was just right down the street. And Lisa. I love, I love Lisa, that, that was a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I especially was interested in the how they, um, the women at the time were just horrified by using the live animal or the dead animals on people's hats. I was just watching a very interesting YouTube about the history of that, of, um, you know, grotesque kind of aesthetics in the past from that Victorian age. Um, and I wanted to also mention that one of your staff members, Sarah Nella Linares, gave a presentation for us on fungi last year and was fantastic. And I keep getting requests to invite her back. Oh, so that's maybe great. We can have her do a sparkle program in the future. She was really uh, fantastic and a great teacher and making it easy to understand and fun and engaging even for adults. <laughs> I'm yes, sure she's well, fantastic with kids too. Serenella Linares is our director of adult programs and she is also a mycologist, so a mushroom queen. If anything you need to know about mushroom and fungi, she can tell you. Um, and she's actually the person who puts together our naturalist hours, those one hour evening programs at happy hour time to give you lots of um, interesting nature information of all kinds, not just mushrooms. Oh, okay, and those are free to attend? They're not free. I believe oh. the ticket price is $15, uh, but they're well worth it. And we can just find them easily on your website? Yes, if you just go to anshome.org and then go to education, adult education, you'll find all the naturalist hour. In fact, I think it's even on our homepage so that you could just click through right from our homepage to the naturalist I'll, hour. I'll post it in our newsletter. Great, too, because we you. have a lot of fungi fans in our community. <laughs> I think Joanne had her hand up and then Cecilia, and then we might want to move on to the um, to your seven wonderful suggestions. Okay, good. Joanne, were you waving at us? No, no. Oh, okay. Then we'll we'll go to Cecilia. Yeah, well, I was happy to hear about the Wood End Nature Sanctuary, so I will have to go check it out. And you're saying it's open 365 days a year, so uh, well, there's no gate, and but I'm sure you can't go inside the building. You just basically have to wander around. Right, I because of yeah, because of the pandemic, our building is closed. Except we do have the Audubon Naturalist Shop, and the Audubon Naturalist Shop is open five days a week, and it's full of nature treasures. Whether you're a bird uh, feeder and you want some bird seed, or you need a new mushroom uh, identification guide, whether you'd like a nature-themed toy as a gift for a friend or a grandchild, or whether you just want something to uh, perk up your home with a nature theme, you can find that at our naturalist shop. We're open from dawn to dusk and the trails aren't all open, but we've marked the trails that are open. And if you have somebody that really likes looking at big equipment, they would enjoy coming too at this moment because we have some big trucks on site. And you basically just park on the street? No, there's parking on the property. So you can just okay. drive right in and find a parking place and then walk our trails. Great, thank you.
Lisa, do you want to kick it off with your recommendation? Yeah. All right, we'll get back to screen sharing. And what I think I'll do, as long as time allows, is after each one of the seven suggestions, I'll open uh, the questions. So you can ask me questions about that particular suggestion, and then we'll move on to the next one. Hmm. I just have to get back to my screen sharing. Only takes me a minute. Okay. So how you can help on Earth Day and every day. And it's seven actions for seven generations. And really, these are all climate mitigation strategies. If you think about what is the biggest environmental threat facing our nation and our planet today, it is the effects of climate change. And so I feel like today we're in the place that Rachel Carson was back in the 1960s when she was thinking about pesticide impact on the planet. Today, we need to think about climate impact on the planet. And I believe that one of the disservices we environmentalists may have done to our fellow country people is that we uh, have been pretty gloom and doom. And sometimes I think folks throw up their hands and think, well, the icebergs are melting, the polar bears are drowning, there's nothing I can do. I really wanna dispel that idea. There is a lot that we can do. And if you want proof about what's possible when humans change their behavior, just think about what happened to air quality during the pandemic. When we all stayed home, CO2 levels dropped, smog levels dropped, emissions dropped. And it's not that I'm suggesting the rest of us stay home. Lord knows I just want to get out there and be in person with people again. But we can keep going with some of the behaviors that are so beneficial to our planet, beneficial to ourselves, but also help mitigate the effects of climate change. So the first suggestion I have for you is manage your land like an ecosystem boss. What does a boss do? A boss takes charge. And whatever land you have to manage, whether it's your own plot of dirt or a faith community that you belong to or a library that you frequent, if there's a spare square inch of land, you can do something good for the earth with it. Nothing beats climate change like nature-based local solutions. Trees are one of our best defenses. Their canopy cools the earth. Their root system helps make it easier for water to perk into the ground. And you've probably heard, you know, when was the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago? When's the next best time? Today? Plant a tree, plant a native plant that provides wildlife value, something that produces berries or nectar or pollen, and do that so that our wildlife that's traveling around the the region or migrating through the region have these good places to stop, to refuel, to rest, to nest. The more that we can plant up our square inches with plants that are beneficial to wildlife, the better we're going to do in cooling the earth's surface, in capturing stormwater, and in supporting the wildlife that we have here and don't want to lose. I've given you a, a, an email address here, I'm, I'm sorry, a website address, woodend-garden, which gives you some examples of really powerful native plants that help lots of animal species. So I wanted to stop and ask what questions you have about managing land for climate change. Just, um, I know that we're always told uh, to use mulch. And I know at Brookside at one point, they were saying, well, don't just go buy like wood chips or shredded bark, but they also have this leaf mulch, which is more of a compost type thing. So I think that's something good to use. And that's available to us. You can go to Tacoma Park here and pick it up yourself. You can, and, and there's, a diff there's a difference, Cecilia, in um, what you put on top of your garden. So of course, we all want to suppress weeds, right? That's a, that's a given, well, fewer weeds to pull. But if you put hardwood mulch down, it takes a really long time to break down. 
and it doesn't return nutrients to the soil quickly at all. Um, if you were to switch instead to what's called shredded pine mulch, which is also a wood mulch, but it's a soft wood mulch, you would find that that would break down much more quickly. But if you really want to get down to business, go to your local garden center or in Tacoma Park for bulk and you can get either leaf grow or comp row. And those are made at county composting facilities. You know how you put your yard waste out? Well, that yard waste turns into that black gold that's full of wonderful nutrients for the soil. And so if you think about a hierarchy of mulches to use, skip the hardwood and either go with the comp row or leaf grow or the shredded pine mulch and you'll return nutrients to the soil much more quickly. As you might imagine, we have such clay soil here that when water hits clay soil, it doesn't soak in. And remember, we're trying to keep that water out of our streams and our lakes and our rivers because if it goes too quickly, it'll carry sediment and pollution to the streams. So the more you add compost, the more you make that clay permeable so the water will sink in. What were the sources for that that you mentioned? You can generally find comp grow and leaf grow at all of your garden centers. I'm not sure that's true at the biggies like Home Depot, but at the Johnson's and the American Plants and the other local bankies used to have it, but now I think they're out of business. You can find that. And in Tacoma Park, they actually have a bulk station that you could drive up with a garbage can or some bags and fill it up and bring it uh, home to your garden from there. Yeah, that's off of Ritchie Avenue, I think. Martine? Um, uh, before I ask my two questions, I'll add on a little bit to the mulch thing. Um, Tacoma Hort Listserv has now has a saying that leaf grow is the new uh, toilet paper. It's that <laughs> uh, hard to find. Um, I go to JW Wright up on New Hampshire. They've been told there's no more till June or July, but then somebody came in with clean bags that had come from Home Depot. So Home Depot obviously has cut out the little guys somehow in getting a supply to them. Tacoma Park Ace has some, but the other suggestion, if for some reason Tacoma Park bulk mulch doesn't work for you, uh, College Park bulk, um, bulk mulch, and I don't know where that location is has also been described as pure gold. I think that's the, the scuttlebutt on mulch for the moment. I have two questions. Um, our driveway is not in great repair, um, but the prospect of using that um, uh, driveway material that allows the water to seep through it's very expensive. Are, is there anything on the horizon that might make that more reasonable? So I'll, I'll talk about that in a couple of ways. One is that okay. part of material choices for permeability is that you need to have level um, level driveway. So if you're, if you're thinking about a level surface, permeable yes. surfaces will work for you. If you're on an angle, you probably have to come up with some different solutions and I have some solutions for that. Um, at Woodend, you can see a couple of different examples. We've changed two of our parking lots into uh, permeable parking lots that are made with a system. I'll try to describe it with my hands. At the very bottom are big rocks. And then above that are medium rocks. And then above that is, um, it almost looks like a plastic waffle a plastic waffle series on top that's filled with small rocks. And then on top of that are laid little cobblestones and small rocks between the cobblestones. And that whole system not only lets the water percolate through, but it also um, stores it underneath until it can um, flow out into the ground. But another thing that's um, on view at our sanctuary is driveway trench drains, where instead of making the entire driveway surface permeable, we just cut in two trench drains that shoot the water out both sides. 
So that's another possibility that's less expensive. It's a traditional asphalt driveway we have, but we put in these two trench drains that to my mind look pretty attractive, but they shoot the water out the side into the grass. A third thing that's on view at Wood End is permeable concrete. That's our sidewalk on the Briarly Road side of our property. And that is a new kind of concrete that is poured just like old concrete, but when it sets, there are lots of air spaces between the rocks that make up the concrete. And so that's another solution for getting permeability. In terms of hierarchy of expense, I think it would probably be uh, the, the pavers, the permeable pavers as most expensive, then permeable concrete as second most expensive, and then trench drains as the least expensive of the three options. So I encourage you to come to Woodend and just check it out, see what visually floats your boat. Um, and I applaud you for thinking about making your driveway permeable. What a great way to capture stormwater. We, in Indian Spring, which is our neighborhood, there's a saying that, that we are called land of the lakes, that it's so <laughs> level. <laughs> Aha. My second question is about um, fighting mosquitoes. Um, we got those, those, I don't remember the name, they're black buckets with a little insert and the mosquito, mama mosquitoes go back in and they can't come out or something like that. And I'm ready to just use uh, BP dunks in trays of water around the yard. And it sounds like that's not too damaging. I just yeah, wondered I, if you had some advice on all that. You know, the best thing you can do if it's possible is to get the standing water out of your yard. And um, if that's not possible, then I do think that the occasional use of a dunk will just suppress the, um, the, the larva population. It doesn't take much water at all for a mosquito larva to thrive. So that's an important um, thing to note that even just this, you know, like, when my kids were little and they'd leave a Frisbee upside down in the yard and it get filled with water, I'd come back three days later and sure enough, there'd be mosquito larva in it. So it doesn't really take very much water for mosquitoes to thrive. But dunks have a pretty good reputation. Nothing's perfect in terms of, um, you know, putting a pesticide in the, in the land, but dunks have a pretty good reputation of not harming amphibians, not harming other kinds of aquatic organisms. So I would give that a try. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Cecilia. Yeah, just a quick question. When you mentioned the permeable parking and you were talking about the large rocks and the medium rocks and whatever, what depth total are we talking about? Kind of. It's an excellent question, Cecilia. And I, I wanna say it's maybe six feet we went down to get all those different layers. It might've been a little bit less. Wow. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pretty big dig. And, and I'll tell you what, in one parking lot, we didn't do it because we had um, so many tree roots that would have been impacted. And that was too much stress on those tree roots. So the two parking lots where we put in the permeable paving, we weren't really impacting a lot of tree roots, but we kept it out of a place where tree roots would have been severely impacted. Great. Okay, we should probably press on because we have six more actions to go. All right, so the next suggestion that I have for all of us is to become a science superhero. I previewed a little bit with you our Creek Critters smartphone app for testing water quality in streams. But I wanted to let you know that there are so many different ways to participate in community science. If you are a, a smartphone user, using eBird to identify birds that you see really helps scientists understand the prevalence of bird species and their migratory habits, which are really being um, sh are really shifting because of climate change iNaturalist is kind of the everything app. You can use it to connect to a community of experts who will look at the picture that you've snapped and they will get back to you with an identification of what you're looking at. So that could be great if you see a really cool caterpillar or something in the wild. But that data that you're providing also helps us keep track of the biodiversity in our region. And studying changes in biodiversity gives us some good information to help us mitigate those climate change um, 
those climate change effects. If we see what's happening, we can kind of get in the way of the bad effects. Leaf snap is another fun one for plant identification, especially good for trees. And since I'm kind of a planty, I really like to use leaf snap if I don't know a tree leaf. But there are also um, other ones that you can participate in. There's one called um, the there's one called Bud Burst, which tracks the opening of buds across the country. So you could be looking at your tulips or you can be looking at your cherry trees. And that helps us understand how climate is changing when flowers are opening. There's another one that's all about cricket calls. If you can listen to the cricket calls and identify what species you're hearing, that tells us about the prevalence of invasive crickets. Believe it or not, we have crickets from Asia that are taking over the habitat of our native crickets. So I really encourage you to participate in community science projects, not only because it connects you to nature and it's fun, but the data that you collect really helps scientists analyze and prepare for climate change. So I didn't know if anybody has, maybe somebody's participating in a citizen science project and wanna talk about it, or if somebody has a question about a citizen science project they'd like to get involved in. I know a person who would love one or more of these once he retires, I'll be giving him this list. Oh, good. There's another great uh, community science program called Frog Watch that's helping us track uh, our amphibians in the region that um, amphibians seem a little less adaptable when it comes to climate change. So we wanna keep good track of what kinds of frogs and salamanders are in our region and how they're doing. So that's another fun one. Uh, do you take advantage of all the professional scientists in the Washington area, be they at USDA, EPA, NOAA, wherever? Yes, we do, Gary. And in fact, we try to enlist a lot of them to be speakers at our Naturalist Hour. You know, while the, the, the great thing about the um, pandemic is because we've gone all virtual, we don't have to talk anybody into driving anywhere. They could just plug in and give us an hour of their expertise from their home office. And so we've been having lots of really interesting scientists come and talk to us about what's happening. I'm thinking in particular about um, Dr. Ramsey, who's this bug guy, who's all about um, our bee species and what's happening to our bee species in the region. So I encourage you to look at that lineup for our naturalist hour and get tune into some of those local scientists. And related to that, uh, what should we be doing uh, related to this coming surge of cicadas? Uh, I was hoping somebody would ask that. Well, um, I will type in the chat a, um, a, a website for everyone to go to. It's called friendtocicadas.org. And we um, developed this website in conjunction with George Washington and Georgetown universities to provide lots of information about the life cycle of cicadas and also kind of ignite people's fascination with this incredible biological event that's gonna happen. We wanna kind of turn the ew into ah oh, about this emergence. I just think, wow, evolution did what? And so here's some things to know. Cicadas don't have mouth parts. They're only here for one purpose and that's to make more cicadas. They will be really loud. On their loudest day, they'll probably be up at the 100 decibel level. So that's gonna be really loud when they all get to singing together. They aren't harming our trees, but they do lay their eggs at the tips of the um, woody plants that we have. So that would be trees and woody shrubs. And after they're done, the, the place where they've made a little slit to lay their eggs, that tip of the tree will die and fall to the ground as will the nymphs. And then those nymphs go right back underground and kind of hang out for 17 years developing until they come back up again. So it's an incredible natural phenomena. And I think we should, you know, there will be some moments when a cicada flies at you and hits you right between the eyes because they're terrible pilots, but there'll be some moments of just sheer awe at the incredible things that nature can do. Do you know a pinpoint date when we can expect them? Well, it tends to depend specifically on soil temperature with 64 degrees in the soil. 
being the time that emergence is really going to rev up. It's a little hard to know exactly when 64 degrees will hit the soil. We think they'll start to come out about the middle of, uh, about the end of April is when we'll first start to see the little emergences happening. And they'll really start crescendoing kind of in the mid to late May part of the year. By the end of June, they'll all be gone. There will be a lot of them. So a lot of cicada carcasses might need some shoveling, you know, some bagging up to get rid of them. But one of the things that's a positive, you know, we were talking about soil health and adding compost. This is like the world's biggest aeration project in our region. Those little tunnels that they make to come up out of the ground are great for water percolation. Let's see a show of hands of everyone who plans to be around for the next time they come back. <laughs> I have a question to follow up on those. Yeah, Carolyn, can I go back to David? He's patient with oh, Yes, absolutely. David, please. Uh, mine's just a quick question. Those apps that you mentioned, are they available at your site or you need to go to the app store? Ours is free in the app store. So that's the way to do okay. it is just search Creek Critters in the app store or if you have um, an Android in the Google Play store. My question is um, that I, uh, in my lawn, I have dozens of holes in the ground that looks like I've gone through giving my, gra my grass and, and lawn an aeration. And each one of the holes is about a, the size of a thumb. And the dogs are interested. They go and you know kind of scrape at it. But I've been wondering whether those are, um, they, they have to be something to do with cicadas. Are they, they curly? It, well, the, the excavation takes a while, so they could in fact be excavating. I'd probably have to see it to tell you for sure. I'll tell you a funny story about the dog. The la uh, my dog, the last time the cicadas came out was a, a small, very food motivated corgi. And when the cicadas came out, he thought he had died and gone to heaven. He's like, it is, the, I am in the land of flying chicken nuggets. <laughs> and he just ate his full, his fill of those cicadas. So if you have a dog, you might want to watch what they eat during cicada time. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. I've so heard that the dime-sized holes are cicadas. They could well be cicadas. Getting ready to come yeah. out. Getting ready to come out. It's quite a show. Okay. So let's go ahead for our next action. So step lightly, the pandemic really showed us how if we change our transportation habits, we change the composition of our atmosphere, we change how much CO2 is heading up into the atmosphere and, and producing that sort of greenhouse effect. So when we cut down our car use, we can, and we have shown that we can reduce those greenhouse gases. So what I'm thinking about for all of us is just let's retain some of our pandemic habits of walking more, of biking more, even scootering. Uh, we can carpool once we get our vaccines, right? We can drive fuel efficient cars and we can fly less. I know we all have pent up travel interests, but think carefully about how you're getting somewhere. And if there's a way to cut down on the amount of greenhouse gases your travel produces, it will help us as a nation and as a planet. And here in our region, one of those key ideas is around beltway widening. Additional traffic lanes in urban area after urban area have shown to do nothing more than add cars to the road. And I think we now as a nation, but especially here in the DC metro region, have to really advocate for support for our transit projects that have taken such a hit during the pandemic and stop thinking about 20th century solutions to congestion on the roads, 20th century solutions being additional traffic lanes and think about 21st century solutions. Let's get more and different kinds of transit into our systems so that people have alternative ways to move around the region without adding significantly to greenhouse gases. Anybody wanna talk about their experience of not driving very much during the pandemic? Did you walk more steps? I think I've been to the gas station maybe 
maybe four times since March of 2020. Yep, that's a lot of greenhouse gases that stayed in your tank and didn't go into the atmosphere, Doug. I have a goal of getting 10,000 or more steps a day, at least six days a week. So I, um, I started, instead of driving to Whole Foods, which is like six blocks from where I live in Foggy Bottom, I, uh, we walk more often, we go more often and walk and, um, or I, you know, I walked to the bank the other day instead of swinging by, driving and swinging by, uh, you know, I would usually try to do that when I was en route to or from somewhere, but it also, you know, that saves a little bit of, of gas, I guess. And it does. Energy. It keeps a, a little bit of emissions out of the air. And I think if we can retain some of those habits that we might have gotten into, um, yeah. we have a little corner grocery store in our uh, neighborhood. And that was definitely sort of our source for, oh, I forgot an onion. You know, we would just walk up and get our onion. And I think we will continue to do that instead of getting right. in our car. Right. Well, we're uh, sort of lucky in where most of us live in Silver Spring. There's a very walkable neighborhood three, four blocks down in one direction from my house is Sligo Creek Park. And I take my four mile walks there most days of the week. In the other direction, it's a it's maybe a mile walk, 20 minutes to the Metro and there's a Safeway and a CVS and a Whole Foods. So I can, my car can sit in the driveway three, four days in a row and just rust. Oh, that's excellent. I, I don't wish your car to rust, Gary, but I'm glad it's sitting in your driveway. That's terrific. Anybody else or should we press on? Okay, we got it. Someday I'll get good at sharing screens just when we don't need to anymore, right? Okay, so this is the big four. Probably if you're like me, you came up on three, reduce, reuse, and recycle. But now it's the big four. And the first part of the big four is refuse. And that sounds like kind of a mean word. So I always think about this as no thank you. No thank you, I don't need a plastic bag. No thank you, I don't need a plastic water bottle. No thank you is your way of refusing to add waste to our environment. And so one of the things that certainly our parents' generation did is they lived with less and they recycled what they have. And I think it's just time for all of us to kind of dig back into that ethic of, do I really need this thing? My husband and I just downsized our house. Boy, if you ever want a window on too much stuff, <laughs> we, we got it. And so many trips to Goodwill and so many trips to Wider Circle and so many trips to the Montgomery County Waste Transfer Station where they do a fabulous job of recycling. You can make one stop at electronics recycling and the next stop at metal recycling and the next stop at cardboard recycling. And so I think as we move things into and out of our homes, thinking about how much is enough is really critical to our climate um, footprint in the world. We also have this wonderful aspect. I'm just speaking. I can't see everybody in the room. I think we're all of a certain age or older where we can teach others. We can be the ambassadors for, uh, in my house, it's like me stepping on the garbage and looking in and saying, oh no, honey, that goes in recycling. So that happens a lot. But I think we can always teach others about how to do this, how to refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And one of the big things that's interesting to know is that in the United States, this isn't true in the DC metro region, but in the United States, agriculture is the second biggest producer of um, greenhouse gases. So if we can eliminate our food waste, we can do a really good job of helping to reduce the amount of CO2 going into the air. And there are just some key things that you probably already all do. So just give yourself credit if you already always do this. You plan ahead, you think about what meals you're going to make, and then you shop smartly for those meals. Um, I had some groceries delivered 
uh, over the pandemic and I made some mistakes. I thought I was ordering a small container of sour cream and it turned into be a five pound container of sour cream. And so as I uh, visited friends, you know, we couldn't visit inside, but we'd visit outside. I bring little jars of sour cream to all my friends. So if you happen to have too much of something, just share it and don't be a perfectionist. Be like your mom, cut out the brown spots in the apple. Don't just ditch it. And of course, compost. And if you can't compost in your own home, you can help compost at a community garden. We have uh, the compost crew comes to pick up our compost from our curbside and then they deliver compost back to our yard. There's this nice website, Make the Most of Food Challenge. And I'll remember to type this in the, um, I'll remember to type this into the chat, which is the, um, it's a food waste challenge where one week you, one week you, hang on, let me get this right. You just study how much food you're wasting. And then the next week, after you study how much food you're wasting, you actively try to reduce it. And so we've been doing that in my house and it's really interesting. Um, we're wasting a lot less food now that we're paying attention to what um, goes in the trash versus what goes in the compost versus what goes in our tummies. Does anybody have any questions about eliminating your food waste, reducing, reusing, and recycling. I, I, you mentioned the compost pickup and delivery in your neighborhood. I mean, I don't think that's around here, correct? I think it is. I think compost yeah. crew does work in uh, Silver Spring. It's, it's not free. You have to request because it certainly doesn't come as part of the county service. It's not. It's actually oh. a separate service that you do have to pay for. Okay. Uh, but since since I'm in a rental house right now, I don't really want to set up a compost operation because I don't know how long I'm going to stay there. But I feel so committed to composting that I pay a small fee once a month for folks to pick up my compost every week. It just goes out same day as your trash. And then they deliver back to me um, bags of compost from their compost operation. Again, since I'm in a rental, I'm not putting that on the soil there, but I just bring it to work. And our garden manager uses the compost at, at our sanctuary. And so what's that called and how much does it cost? I don't remember how much it costs. I apologize. Lots of facts floating around in here. The service is called Compost Crew. Two words, Compost Crew. There's nope. also another one called Veterans Compost, I think. But com compost crew can go down if you get a certain number of people in your neighborhood to join. Iska just did that. Um, so if you aren't seeing those buckets around my old neighborhood, you might want to get on the list serve and see if you can rustle up a crew that wants to do it. What was that? Veterans what? Veterans Compost. Okay. So compost crew will have a lower price if you get a certain number of people to sign up. I don't know more details about Veterans Compost. Right. There were a flurry of hands on that one. So I see Joanne and then uh, oh. gets rewarded oh. using the sim symbol and then Gary. So Joanne. Hi. Um. I do compost in, in my um, housing development. We have three bags uh, that I can put things in. And I, I guess a farmer or somebody comes along and collects it. Um, and I thought I forgot the next thing I wanted to say. Well, congratulations on composting. I think that's terrific. If you do want a compost bin for your yard and you don't have one, Montgomery County does have free compost bins. They're kind of round, flexible plastic. And if you want a pickup spot, you can pick those up at our Audubon Naturalist Shop at Wood End Nature Sanctuary. And those are free. So if you want to put that in your yard, you can come grab one from us and get started. And we have some good information on how to compost at home. On uh, recycling, uh, 
Yeah, the, we have these blue bins we put out every week or whatever, and the county instructions are just put all your aluminum and steel and glass and plastic. But I've been reading that at least of the plastic, something like 90% of the plastic is not really reusable, recyclable because of world economic conditions of who eventually use it. So what plastic can actually be recycled into something useful? So most plastic can be recycled. I think what you're reading about is the marketplace for it. So one of the reasons that uh, counties have found it important to recycle is they sell what we recycle. They sell the glass, they sell the plastic. And the plastic market for recycling has been soft. And so there's some concern that things aren't getting recycled because they can't sell it. But Montgomery County is particularly uh, committed to recycling, so I wouldn't fear it. And once the pandemic has um, lifted and we can go touring again, I highly recommend going to the Montgomery County Recycling Facility. It is awesome. It's like a giant Rube Goldberg device. It's really loud, they give you earplugs, but it's this massive machine that has magnets and conveyors and blowers. And you watch the metal can go up and the plastic bottle go to the left. And it's amazing how it all gets sorted mechanically by these incredibly designed machines. So I highly recommend that as a tour. So, right, I've taken a tour there and it's really fascinating. I'm gonna to go to David and then we still have three more recommendations and less than 15 minutes. So Ooh, Dave we better go, yes. Because <laughs> um, you have three more recommendations, I'm gonna pass. Okay, or you can type a question into the chat and I can answer it that way too. All right, let's see, back to share screen. Am I sharing? No. No, not. Okay, let's try again. You would think I'd be better at this by now, wouldn't you? Golly. Okay, here's our next recommendation. Eat more plants. So this is related. So that statistic I gave you about agriculture being the second leading contributor, it's actually more refined than that. It's animal agriculture. So when we are farming our cows, our sheep, our goats, our pigs, our chickens, we are producing a lot of greenhouse gases. And if all of us decided we were going to cut down on our meat consumption, we could have a marketplace change in our agriculture. And we could see some of that animal agriculture transition to plant agriculture because of market demand. So I'm not advocating that anybody go vegetarian or vegan, but I think if you think consciously about your weeks, and I know in our family, we're sort of like, okay, let's have a protein and a starch and a vegetable on our plates. But if you once a week, just substitute that protein for something planty instead, you can start to change the marketplace for agriculture. And so one suggestion, you know, some of us maybe during Lent don't eat meat on Fridays. That's a good way to get started and maybe just keep that up. Or you could have start by doing meatless Mondays. And also one of the things that we find is the most motivating for young people is when they grow food themselves. We have a wonderful program with our green kids school programs called Salad Science, where the kids uh, grow and harvest their own organic greens. And then we have a salad party. And a lot of these kids haven't ever grown a vegetable, don't, they don't like salad, but then when they grow and harvest their own greens, they can't wait to eat the salad. I had one little boy come through the salad bar line and he said, I'm back for sevenths. He was so excited to eat his own salad. He had seven helpings. So I think if you can be a gardener somewhere in your neighborhood or in your community, you can really inspire a lot of people to eat more plants. Does anybody have a good vegetable garden story that they want to share? Mm. 
the rabbits may come and deposit babies in your vegetable pots. <laughs> yes, were they Which named are very Flopsy, cute. Flopsy, very Mopsy, cute. and Cottontail? Were those the names? <laughs> and then that's your free meat source for the rest of the world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're bad, Doug. You're bad. And, and deer treat all the gardens in our neighborhood as a salad bar. Yes, they do. Isn't that interesting? What we plant is very helpful to the deer. You might be noticing that deer are having twins a lot. Um, and deer don't generally have twin fawns unless they're very well fed. And that's because our home landscapes are such good sources of nutrition for them. I had a fun experience at my house. My um, youngest son, who's in his 20s, asked if he could bring a friend for Easter dinner. And I said, sure, of course. And then he said, well, Will's a vegan. <laughs> and suddenly my Easter dinner plans changed. But I will tell you, I was able to translate my uh, Italian mushroom rotolo recipe pretty easily to something that didn't involve any animal agriculture at all. And believe it or not, you can make substitute ricotta cheese out of tofu. So eating more plants is possible even when it's unexpected. <laughs> Joanne, did you have something? Yeah, I remembered what I wanted to say. I, I was watching the commercial on television and they're coming <clears throat> back with recyclable water bottles, um, some kind of plastic. Uh, I haven't seen it. I don't usually buy plastic bottles, but um, you know, I remember when I used to take the bottles back. Oh, me too. My little red wagon was full of five cent deposit bottles. That was a really good thing. I do think that there is a difference between recycling into a stream that the county is trying to sell and deposit uh, recycling. Deposit recycling is based on the manufacturer bearing that cost of the deposit coming back to the consumer. So if I had a preference for how we recycled, I would recommend deposit recycling because then the manufacturer is actually having to take responsibility for the waste that their product produces. And so, you know, that's something that comes up periodically in our legislative um, discussions in the region. And when you think about it, if you've got your reusable metal water bottle and you use that for a year, the carbon footprint of that water bottle is the one-time production. If you're doing um, a returnable water bottle, Every time you return it, there's, there's carbon going into the atmosphere to reproduce a recycled bottle. So if there's a deposit bill, then the manufacturer bears some of that cost. And maybe that should encourage us all to just think about as many reusable containers and use them for as long as possible. All right, let's hop to our next one. Come on, let's show you. So our next screen, this is one of my favorites. It's just follow the children. We all know that children are the future of the world and youth engagement in climate action is at an all time high. Think of the Greta Thunbergs. Think of all the young people in our region who are leading climate marches, who are talking to their legislators, who are rallying their peers to activate around climate change. And what I would say about these youth movements for climate change is that they need us as allies and advisors and as cheerleaders and people who provide resources, but they don't need us to boss them around. So if you wanna get involved with youth climate movements, please do volunteer to be an ally for them. It's much easier to stand up to a police officer if you've got somebody who's 65 standing next to you. And I just think that our young people, I feel so hopeful because of all the activation they have around climate change. This climate mess that we have made is theirs to inherit. And the fact they're feeling very politically motivated to speak up, to speak out, to ask for legislative change, 
makes me feel very optimistic about the future of our world. And I'm curious to know, have any of you gotten involved with any of these youth climate movements? Mm. I, I was, um, but the, then the pandemic came. Yeah, yeah, that's made it a lot harder. But don't forget, they can always use our resources. If we have a few extra dollars to spare, a youth climate movement can use those dollars. So even if you can't be there in person, providing them with resources really gives them the fuel, and that would be green fuel, right? <laughs> to keep doing the good work that they're doing. Carolyn? Yeah, I'd like to ask Joanne what it was that you were doing, please. Um. I forgot, um, but I went on a march with them um, I guess it was in the fall uh, in <clears throat> oh I nineteen. Well, I will, yeah, I will say, Joanne, that's a great example of allyship, is joining their marches. That's a great example of being an ally to youth climate action. When it comes up again, Carolyn, I'll let you know. Let us all know. <laughs> and our um, member, Jim Anderson, heads up the, um, either the whole Friends of Sligo Creek or else the Weed Warrior component. But Friends of Sligo Creek has times when they clean the creek and they need adults for that too, to help the kids with their disposable gloves and all that stuff. That's a great way to help the kids sort of take ownership of stewarding the earth. Thank you for those suggestions. Okay, we've just got a couple minutes left. So let's go ahead and go to our last action. And I bet this is one that everybody here already does. And that is up your political IQ and vote. So organizing, mobilizing and taking action is really important these days because so much of what happens around climate in our region has to do with land use policy. In uh, the DC metro region, our two top sources of greenhouse gases are transportation first and buildings second. Now, depending on where you are, it might flip buildings first, transportation second, but those are our top two sources. And so what we do with our land, on our land, around transit, around protecting green spaces is essential to armoring the region to withstand climate change. The Maryland legislature just wrapped up and we had some great outcomes and we had some real disappointments. One great outcome is the legislature passed a bill to plant 5 million trees over the next five years. That's amazing because trees are one of those great green solutions for mitigating the climate crisis. But then we had a huge disappointment because the Senate and the House couldn't agree on the um, climate solutions bill. They couldn't agree on when the state should get to net zero and what percentage increase, a decrease in admission should happen year over year. And I think as voters, we have to let our legislators know that that's a big disappointment to us. We need our legislators to take very bold action to make sure that we're getting to a place where we can sustain the earth because this is all about sustainability. And um, local decisions really matter and especially with local decisions, your voice matters a lot. We got that tree bill passed, I swear, because we called out every action maker that we could by email, by telephone. We said, now is the time. We've got two days left till the legislative session ends. And that got the tree bill passed. So local voices really matter. And if you think about land use and transportation as our big climate issues in this region, you'll be able to pick out the legislation that makes a big difference. So I encourage you to um, 
value your voice. It is amazing how few of us it takes to change a legislator's mind to say, stop, look at this from my point of view. This is why I think this is important. Legislators listen, but we have to talk to them. So does anybody have any questions about legislation in our region? What's coming up that's critical? So I would like us all to pay attention to uh, the Thrive 2050 master plan for Montgomery County. It's been a long time since we had a master plan for the county. And this master plan is still in its planning and listening and evolving stages. I think it's critical that we all get to know the plan. We let our legislators know what we like about it and what we don't like about it. And I think what often happens in the moment is that we have good plans on the table, but in the moment of a budget crunch or something like that, then we fail to deliver the money to implement things like good transit. We fail to deliver the money for things like affordable housing. So we don't force people way into far, far from city centers to have an affordable home. And then of course, how do they get to their work? They get on the beltway, they get on 270. So we need to think about keeping density where it is, protecting open space and green space where it is and making sure folks can afford to live close to transit and that the transit is there to move them around. So these are really key issues for climate. I also think that we always have to be paying attention to our water. If you think about our region, it's as if we have a capillary system of streams. Almost everyone in Montgomery County, in the District of Columbia, in Arlington, Fairfax, Loudoun, lives within a quarter mile of a stream. And so everyone has water pretty much in their backyard. And if we don't pay attention to that increasing deluge of water that's hitting our land and running off into our streams and our rivers and our bay, we're gonna lose a hold of our water quality. So pay attention to land use, to transportation, to access to green space and to our water. And those issues will be a good guide for you. And just make sure to pick up the phone or send an email and say that it matters to you what we do to mitigate climate change. I think that is a terrific way to end as a reminder that we can all be invested and involved um, in an issue that affects all of us so much. And yes. uh, I wanna thank you, you were wonderful. Um, I wanna encourage everyone to take, take advantage of the Audubon Naturalist Society. It really is a great place to visit if you have not been out there. Um, thanks to Lisa Martin for co-sponsoring the Silver Spring Town Center, Inc. And thanks to everyone who joined in today. Give a quick round of applause to Lisa, yay. Thank you all, what great questions. I really had a terrific time. It was so engaging to be with you today. Thanks everybody. This was excellent. Really Thank good. you. Well Thank done. you, Lisa. Really good. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. much, Lisa. It was terrific. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.